Yeah, no, I'll take one. Great, great, thanks. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Let's uh, let's go ahead and get uh, started. Uh, welcome to this uh, state of the uh, school uh, address. Uh, I have to say, this is my third of these. The first was right after I arrived, so it was sort of, hello, I'm here. The uh, next one was, I've been here a year. Uh, this one will be what's happening uh, two years um, in. I have a few housekeeping things I have to say. For one, I'm going to try and get done in time so that we can have some discussion, and you don't want me to commit yet again death by PowerPoint, so I'm going to try to uh, avoid that. And for those of you who are on Zoom, uh, your lines are on mute, uh, but submit any questions that you have through chat, and uh, Angela uh, will be picking those up and uh, giving them to me. And this is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel coming soon. Okay. And I want you all to see that I have an official Colorado School of Public Health recent piece of swag that holds an awful lot of water. So here uh, is one of these. And hopefully everybody has a piece of paper because you're all going to do some work as we've done in the past during these uh, presentations. I, I love this um, particular slide. I got this years ago from Leon Gordas, who had preceded me as chair of the Department of Epidemiology at Hopkins, and he always showed this on the first day of Epi 1. And uh, everybody would go, he said, well, you're here. And uh, so here I am arriving, and so here we are, October 15th, 2017, and we're up to November 13th, 2019, which means I'm 759 days into being dean. And if a question comes along that I don't want to answer, I'm going to say, you know, it's 759 days, I just can't answer that question. So I may play the 759-day um, card. Now, just a few happenings. So this is the timeline of the school. And last year was the 10th anniversary, of course, of the school. And I dwelled on some of the history, the origins of the department that became the school in uh, 1965, the founding chair, uh, Jock Cobb. 2008, the seminal year when both the school was founded and the Colorado Public Health Act was passed was synergy between saying we want a contemporary public health workforce and the School of Public Health will be involved in creating that. And of course, uh, Dick Hammond, probably known to most of you, was our founding uh, dean. And then moving on to 2019, where we are in the midst of strategic planning. We've finished the development of the strategic plan. I'll come to that. We are moving to implementation. And for what it's worth, we've moved up in the uh, rankings done by U.S. News and World uh, Report to number 23 of the roughly 70 schools of public uh, health. We do happen to be tied with eight other institutions, but you know we, we can, uh, we can uh, move up. It, it's actually really interesting. I think U.S. News and World, and World News and World Report for some of you, you may remember a weekly news magazine that had a somewhat conservative slant that, of course, went out of business years ago, and now I think it makes its money largely by doing this ranking uh, with algorithms that remain secret, but nonetheless, everybody tries to uh, game them. So, you know, just a day in the life, some pictures from the uh, last year, and I, I think what these pictures show is just sort of the diversity of who we are, our students. I see a lot of smiles. I take this as Kathy Bradley at uh, Public Health in the Rockies talking about the school, our table, Mary and friends, uh, Cerise down there, uh, Loran Stallins at the awards events, uh, students inducted into uh, Delta Omega, uh, graduating, faculty looking happy, it's actually a really nice picture. And uh, students, 
looking happy. I, you know, I always tell everybody that they should go to graduation. It's like the best day of the year in academia because everybody who's there is happy. Maybe there's a little selection bias because if you're not there, you might be unhappy. But um, in, in any case, it's, a, it's a, great, uh, a great day in the history of any school. Just a reminder, and I, and I put this up because I think we should be asking ourselves, are we fulfilling our mission, our vision, and our commitments to equity and, and diversity? It's a reminder uh, of what we say our mission is. I think it fits well, continues to fit well. Uh, we have a broad target, uh, both in terms of our region and what we want to do. We have a vision. Become one of the nation's premier institutions for public health, education, research, and practice. I count 23 as premier. Uh, and I think we're moving well in that goal, and the school has evolved uh, a great deal over the last uh, 10 years. And then our commitment to diversity and equity, always more to do, and I, I think we will continue on working on having broader representation among all of us uh, over time. Context. So just a little um, background. Here's some Colorado data about where we, uh, where we rank. Probably should have done this as a quiz and perhaps tortured you for being here, like what's the eighth leading cause of death. But notice that on many of these, we're doing well compared to the nation. We are, in some respects, one of the uh, healthier states, but giving us the task of slowing the pace of becoming unhealthy. Worrisome for all of us are those causes of death at the bottom. Firearm deaths, homicide, drug overdose. These have been called the deaths of despair, okay, with origins that are very complex and are deeply rooted in things going wrong, whether that's unemployment, uh, closing of coal mines in Appalachia, uh, rural communities losing jobs and hospitals and morale, and symptoms. Uh, and you can see there we're not doing as well as we are, say, on cardiovascular disease. Fitness does not necessarily protect against despair. So you can see our problems of firearms. And then there's always stuff going on. Uh, I had breakfast this morning actually with uh, Richard Hoffman and Jill Ryan, uh, who's the head of a CDPHE. We had a good time talking about problems and old problems, new problems. But I think one thing we all agreed on, the three of us agreed, public health is never boring. And the fact that it's never boring in a way is not a good thing. It means something is always uh, coming along. So here, for example, the ongoing concerns about the oil and gas industry, something that we have faculty working on, the uh, vaping problem that we'll come to and talk about a little bit uh, more, uh, school stress, phone, social pressure are behind growing mental health issues, this concern about isolation, um, I guess living with your phone is just not enough. That's reassuring. But uh, those problems, the forever chemicals, the PFAS, the uh, perfluorin poly, uh, alkylated substances that we made that proved useful but last uh, forever. So these are the kinds of problems that keep coming along. So you have a piece of paper. And what I want you to think about is, and we can talk about it, as we think about who we are and what we do and set our agenda for the school, are we linking back to these things? Are we linking back to these data? And if so, how do we do it? Should those, be, those facts be part of what guides what we do? And inherently, we in part do that. We address important public health problems in our research and in our practice. You know, my question is, as we move to implementation of our strategic plan, are we more 
specific in targeting things that are on the public health agenda, that are the priorities of CDPHE, of the counties, and inherently of, uh, of us. So if you have thoughts about that, write them down. You can see that we didn't give you a lot of space to write, but uh, your thoughts are welcome. So you can write and I'll talk. And we'll go back through these. And let, let me turn now. I'm going to go through our education, research, and uh, practice uh, activities. So education, one big happening is so-called Grexit. This is not a term that I made up or anybody here made up, but Laurie Crane, I think, was the first to, uh, the, from whom I heard the term uh, Grexit. So you, as you know, we're just copying the British here who have Brexit, isn't that a cute slide? And uh, we have Grexit. So what is Grexit? Grexit is no longer relying on the GRE as part of the information we use in evaluating students for admission. The decision was made as discussion mounted about standardized testing, about the implications of standardized testing, of its costs, and of the fact that some groups just don't do as well as others. Some of that simply reflecting educational background and opportunity or having the resources to go pay for Kaplan courses, Princeton Review, or whatever to get ready for the uh, G, uh, GREs. And, you know, I've, I've watched this now for years and the pressure mounting for both GREs, the uh, MCATs, uh, test preparation, people taking literally months out of their lives to do nothing but study for a standardized test. Some of those who, of you who are younger probably may have done this. Not a good idea, not a good use of time, not a good use of money. Now, when we talked about this, the uh, discussion was when. And I was thinking that it would take a while to get ready to do it. But everybody responded, uh, the Department's admissions, quickly. Because one thing this does is it really shifts the burden of evaluating our applicants to be much more holistic in part, to perhaps not use GRE as a screen, as a litmus test, if you're not above whatever on this particular uh, test score, analytic, quantitative, you're not a good candidate. So that really shifts the burden. So we've spent a lot of time now, the departments, thinking about what are the criteria? How will we do the um, <coughs> evaluation? So I think this is good. And unlike Brexit, we've got it uh, done. See the title? Worrisome Trends. Okay, so let me tell you what they are. These are the uh, applicants to the schools in the, and programs in the Association of Schools and Programs in Public Health, ASPPH. Uh, these are the admissions, oops, come back. Uh, these are the admissions cycles over the uh, last four years. Cycle 13 would be the group admitted last time. I think I've got that right. And what you can see is the admissions numbers over, the applicant numbers over time. From the peak up there at cycle 12 to our last cycle 13. Okay, and you can see the decline in numbers of applicants. The number of schools and programs is going up. Okay, but this is not about competition. This is about a decrease in the size of the pool of people applying for, uh, applying for our programs. Now, why is this happening? I've heard lots of speculation. Uh, this is the good economy. Uh, this is changes in demographics and the number of people in the right age. Perhaps this is sort of competition with those who are coming out of bachelors in public health programs 
who might be hired uh, into jobs that were previously taken by master's graduates. We don't know, and we don't know whether this will continue. So here's a little bit more of this. Now enrollment trends, percentage of applicants accepted, percentage of accept- acceptance that became new, uh, new enrollments. And nationally, you can see the uh, decline. We did well this year, well meaning holding to the prior year in terms of the numbers of new students. But overall, the total enrollment dropped in part because if you look, you can see 2016, that steep bump up uh, when we had a particularly large group who have now graduated. So the total pool size of students we have is somewhat... um, is somewhat smaller. So this this has many implications. Uh, Clearly, the school went through an era, as did others, when applicants were rising. So where where this is going, of course, we will be continuing to watch. Like other schools, uh, we are doing the best we can to tell our story about the strengths of the Colorado School of Public Health as a place to come, the variety of possibilities across the three campuses. But this is a uh, trend that is uh, important to us and important to our, uh, to our field. And this is a little bit more of the uh, same kind of uh, data. Just want to show you, turning back to education, sort of the, the, the variety and richness of what our students do. So I'm just going to put up a few of the capstone uh, projects Denver metro areas, tobacco retail compliance, social network analysis of community-based opioid treatment, uh, antimicrobial resistance markers among uh, of salmonella, uh, type, which causes typhoid fever, using metabolomics, uh, social network analysis, again, uh, child nutrition uh, at UNC, community art program, and violence prevention curriculum. A huge range of reflecting what we do in uh, public health. I I think I've attended almost every MPH forum since I arrived, and it's really fun. I mean, it's just uh, really delightful to see the variety and then to talk to the uh, students as they stand at their posters and uh, present uh, their work. Although there's this, seems to be a sinking moment for some when they see they realize they're actually talking to the dean. And, uh, but anyway, and our, our students are getting jobs. They're, they're finding next things to, uh, to do. And this is the most, uh, the most recent data. So there continue to be good opportunities in, uh, in public health. We have some new things going on. We have the MPH concentration in population mental health and well-being that is launched. Uh, Jen Leiferman, wherever she is uh, in the uh, lead on this. And new certificates uh, coming online, and I'm not showing you all of them, but there's a a number that uh, are new and available. Our research, I put this up saying some, only because there are so many. And, you know, we cover between our campuses a huge array of research uh, topics. Uh, some examples, recent papers that have come out over the last year, and again, just illustrating the diversity. So uh, oil and uh, gas, HPV vaccine delivery, uh, this global rising problem of chronic kidney disease and agricultural workers that uh, Lee Newman and others have been interested in. Here, home ventilation rates, how tight the homes are, and child uh, respiratory health in cancer, pilot uh, text message campaign to increase screening. Uh, Here's another physiotherapist intention, mental health empowerment and violence against young women in lower income (laughs) countries, Fort Collins commuter study, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And our our research has impact. It shows up... uh, in, uh, in the news, this is on this issue of the PFAS compounds that uh, 
John Adgate, uh, recently funded with colleagues at uh, Colorado School of Mines to look at this problem of water contamination related to the Air Force Base. These uh, chemicals are in firefighting foams. And unfortunately, tests for test fires have led to widespread contamination of water systems. So stay tuned on uh, this one. Uh, the oil and gas always hits the news. Uh, public health vaping uh, has been important. Here's uh, on diabetes prevention. Uh, marijuana, always uh, a topic that will hit, um, hit the news. Stay tuned uh, there. Issues affecting special populations work from Cayenne, the building we are uh, in, uh, and more. We even made the news for Grexit. Okay, and Lori was interviewed, and I was interviewed by the, uh, all right, the Collegian, I think, the CSU uh, newspaper. So uh, any, any media is good media. Uh, and our funding. And I think the good thing about our funding is that we have a very broadly balanced uh, portfolio. The circle I'm showing you here does not really capture all that we do and the scope of funding of, uh, of our faculty. We are looking at that because it's probably important in how we do in those rankings, but not included here, for example, are funds through the Cancer Center. Not included here are funds uh, at CSU. So we're re-looking at how to uh, count this because we think it's important. And then our research and practice centers that house so much of the research and build up the special expertise, the multidisciplinary teams that we need these days to do research. The LEAD Center, uh, the Center for Health, Work, and Environment, Global Health, uh, just highlighting uh, John Bolkins and his group up at uh, CSU you who do really interesting work on emissions, cook stoves, air pollution measures. They're, they're developing these really cool little boxes. They have them that measure particles and other things that you can put on people or in neighborhoods that cost several hundred dollars, not thousands of dollars, and they give us insights into what we're exposed to. M Health, uh, very important, of course, and uh, something, a word I would not have used 20 years ago, would I have used it 10 years ago, Shane? Uh, First M Health word. Okay, so, you know, M Health, a word, of course, that none of us were using uh, before, uh, before that. And we also have the new uh, interinstitutional pilot grant uh, funding, a program launched this year with uh, support from the school and also at this point from. Uh, CSU with three grants uh, funded that were submitted, evaluated competitively. The goal here is to bring the campuses closer together, more partnerships around research. Uh, Kathy Bradley, as Associate Dean for Research, has been very active in promoting these kinds of opportunities. We're looking for center opportunities that can join our uh, campuses. And then I'll just point out that there are many hot topics here. And, you know, a question, again, looking forward is, do we internally organize in more structured ways to say, well, we really want to do more on tobacco vaping and marijuana, a topic where we are doing a lot across the different campuses, uh, but do we network more? Do we provide more structure to go after specific uh, issues? And then practice, okay, which is, you know, so important to this, uh, to this school. And I'll make a comment without naming my prior institutions where I've been, except you know what they were, that things are really, I think, practices far more ingrained in the culture here than other places I've been. And I think it reflects our state-based, population-based, place-based mission. Um, we, you know, live and work here, and I think we know the problems well, and I will say that our faculty, staff, and students are, I think, committed to making sure we have uh, impact. So, you know, one of my comments about this is we are all practitioners, uh, and we should be, and that's as individuals, through our practice activities, through research, 
through what we do to get uh, the word out, you know, whether it's going and talking to a community, talking to your neighbors, talking to the state legislature, U.S. Congress, that's really an experience, uh, or, or more. So, you know, just highlight, there are just so many uh, examples as we sort of look through the news feeds over uh, recent times. So Chris Melby up at uh, CSU, uh, work on preparing this. This came uh, with a report from the uh, network uh, and surveillance activities that Glenn Mays, our new chair of health systems management and policy, carries out, uh, even me. Um, you know, it's, it's hard on some of these issues not to want to say something. You know, vaping being a good uh, example. Do you know that yesterday you saw the report in the New York Times about a double, double lung transplant in a 17-year-old? You know, imagine that, you know, someone whose lungs were destroyed by vaping. You know, it should all make us want to do something, whether that's talking to your neighbor who might say, you know, my kid's vaping, is that bad? To, you know, sending your opinion to your uh, legislator. So, in fact, it was interesting. We had as the case competition, which was on Saturday, vaping was the topic. Uh, and the students had the opportunity to develop a proposal on how to spend $2 million to combat vaping in Colorado. And there was a range of proposed um, solutions. They did a great job. In looking at what they said, I think what they missed was the urgency of doing something. You know, when 17-year-olds when are getting double lung, lung transplants, which are kind of not lifetime, uh, there's uh, a lot of urgency attached uh, to this. Uh, work by Evelyn uh, Barrio. So our practice activities remain robust. The Center for Public Health practice now nicely located on 4 West, uh, escaping 406, uh, escape, with healthy people. Escaping 406, uh, the fourth floor continues to be uh, sort of omnipresent across, uh, across the state. There's many activities that we all do. I will say I think we have more and more contacts with state and local uh, public health, so I think welcome our coming. Uh, Denver Public Health and Environment just uh, agreed to uh, provide support for three students for uh, practicum activities, for example, coming out of meetings and contact and nice follow-up by the uh, Office of Missions and Student Affairs. Uh, and then I think we'll have looked to new initiatives with the strategic plan. Just another uh, example, this was two weeks ago on a Monday night in Greeley, uh, the UNC team and Danny Britton in particular, working with local groups to have this uh, Latino Health Forum uh, with uh, Evelyn Barrio as the speaker. It was actually really interesting. Uh, it was a failure and a success. Uh, at 6 o'clock on a Monday night, there were many different community organizations there that provide services. The community, however defined, was essentially absent. Now, why did the word get out? It is 6 o'clock on a Monday night not a good time to hold an event? Uh, but we used the opportunity to actually talk about what went wrong, if you want to consider this as not working right. So it was a, an educational experience. It was a learning opportunity for all of us to just sit together, about 20, 25 people uh, who know the Greeley community well, to talk about what is the right way. You know, I made suggestions like maybe we need to be in the parking lot of Walmart, and that's where we should be offering services, uh, where the people are. It was held at a community center, but it was a good um, experience. I want to talk for a minute about um, vaping, and just highlight that this is, you know, a crisis. I don't need to tell you that. But it's one where I think um, we've been involved, the Center for Public Health, 
practice has been doing trainings and providing support at the local levels on options, uh, on policy measures that may have uh, effect. There have been, we've spoken at the uh, state, uh, state capitol, an interesting experience. Uh, last week I spoke to the consumer groups of the National Associations of Attorneys uh, General who are interested in what are the potential for litigation to address some of the problems. You remember that 1998 we had this settlement between the Attorneys General and the big tobacco with the master settlement uh, agreement. It still brings us funds. There was a vaping summit at, that we held to bring people together. So I think you know this kind of topic is one where I think we did as individuals and as different groups uh, a lot, and the problem uh, demanded it. So just your next little question moving down is how do we support and enhance our practice activities? And, you know, I, I think, again, our uh, faculty senate, uh, Carolyn DiGiuseppe from Faculty Affairs, put a lot of work into thinking about how do we evaluate uh, practice activities, what, what it does constitute um, being excellent, being meritorious in, uh, in practice. That's part of it, but I, I think we should think you know, sort of on a larger scale about what it is we could, um, what it is we could do. And we'll come back to that when we talk about who are we? You know, what is the Colorado School of Public Health uh, about? Some school uh, happenings, some really good things, like faculty at this campus and at CSU being named as uh, distinguished uh, professors. Very few receive this honor, and uh, here are two. These are awards. I'm just going to go through this. Um, there's so many people who received awards, and the diversity of awards is, I think, reflecting what we do, all the different things we do. So here we go. I'm just going to run through these really fast. And you can see there's a lot of them. So you can see a lot of awards, and we're not a bad-looking bunch. So um, lots of uh, things uh, happening. And then some school-wide symposia. Uh, we, uh, in April, at the 20th anniversary of Columbine, held an all-day symposium. It was intended to be scientific, to bring together people that um, could talk about the science of prevention of school violence. We did this in, co in, in collaboration. Uh, with the Center for Prevention of Violence at uh, Boulder, uh, and reached pretty broad. And then I think we had as many as 250 uh, people there. A reminder, that afternoon was when the sad story of the 18-year-old who landed in Denver, bought a rifle, a shotgun, or something, and somehow wanted to reenact, do something related to the Columbine shootings. As we were there, people were getting no notices that their children's schools were locked down and they needed to go and pick them up. So a, a reminder that this is uh, with us. We uh, worked with the Colorado Air Quality Control Commission and had an all-day symposium to update the commissioners on what is happening with our scientific knowledge about uh, air pollution. Coming next year, uh, the uh, Population Mental Health State of Science event that uh, Jen and her colleagues are uh, organizing that will be held here. Just uh, some school-wide lectures that are coming this year. And last year, we had three speakers. This year, we'll have new speakers that represent a broad range of topics. Lourdes, who will be here Soon, very active in community-based research. Cancer prevention, particularly working with Latino communities. Uh, Shelley Hearn, who's long been active at the Policy Science Interface in D.C., working, in fact, now on urban health issues in, with Denver and other cities. Uh, Pat Remington, uh, whose career was divided between academia and public health. What you should know is that Pat originated the county health rankings, 
And so this is a real opportunity to visit with um, a true expert on population health. And Chris Byrer, our um, uh, convocation speaker, a leading advocate uh, for health and human rights, uh, was president of the International AIDS Society, and other things with a huge global footprint in this area. Now, some things are changing at the school, and people hold jobs, and they move on to new jobs. Uh, Elaine uh, Morado, you're, of course, we sent out a note already, a terrific new opportunity for her to lead a uh, new school of public health at Loyola in uh, Chicago, and Elaine's been with the school for 15 years, if I have the numbers right. University, university school, correct, for 15 years. And I knew Elaine when she was a distance graduate student at Hopkins in the School of uh, Public Health. Even then, I thought she might be a dean one day. <laughs> it was the assignment you did, that's right, that's right. And, uh, and Mary, uh, who has worked very hard in uh, leading our uh, Office of uh, Admissions and Student Affairs, uh, who will be uh, stepping away from that position back to the uh, faculty at CSU, well known to Tracy uh, Nelson, took over in August as the director of that program, and leadership changes at um, UNC, uh, with Danny becoming interim associate dean and uh, Teresa Sharp stepping in as acting program director. So then you might ask questions like, gee, what's going to happen next? Is anybody asking that question? Uh, so my, my answer is stay tuned. And we're going to be looking very carefully at you know, what is the right leadership structure for the, uh, for the future and how we can make things work even better than they have been. So uh, this is, these are all recent, uh, recent enough events that uh, we are in the information gathering and planning uh, phases. And we have uh, a school advisory board. We have an advisory board member here uh, with us. And uh, we have new uh, members coming on to our uh, advisory board, a group of people who have many purposes, friends of the school, guide, guiders of the school, uh, people who uh, advocate for us, uh, people who help us make uh, connections, uh, our new members, uh, Cody, who uh, has been very involved in child uh, health and was in the Ritter administration. Uh, Art Davidson, who was with Denver Public Health for a long time and brings deep knowledge of public health, data systems and informatics. Uh, Frank Judson, uh, with a long career in public health in Denver as well, and a friend and supporter of the school. George Sparks, uh, who runs the Denver Museum of Science and Natural history and is very interested in how science plays into our society. And uh, Claudia Steiner, who is uh, now head of research at Kaiser here, longtime career in Washington at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Policy. So we're very grateful for input from these folks. Uh, advancement, a hat will be circulating uh, soon. Uh, deposit whatever it is you feel you can put in. Uh, so we have had a good year this year. Don't worry, it's got nowhere to go but up, and we're just starting uh, the year. I just want to highlight some of the kinds of uh, giving uh, that we have uh, had, some for scholarships, some for particular areas, some supporting our centers, uh, generous uh, giving uh, by several, actually, RJ, I think, by several to support uh, activities in rural health at UNC. Strategic planning, I think you all know, last year I said we were starting strategic planning. This year we've done a pretty good job of getting through it. Last year I posed this question. We are starting strategic planning for the school. What are the two areas needing the most attention? Here's what you said. Uh, and... So here's this year's question. Uh, what should be our unique niches? And of the many, many, many 
things that are in the strategic plan, we're going to have to pick and choose in the end. And I think some of that relates to how we, how we see our identity uh, moving uh, forward. So I think everybody knows that we went through a strategic planning exercise that essentially involved all of us. And we are declaring the plan as done. It has two pieces, strengthening our core, what it is we do, and then looking forward to meeting emerging uh, challenges. And that is how the report is structured. It has those five pillars for strengthening our core and looking forward these targeted broad uh, areas. And across these, we have many, many, many suggestions, objectives, items to look at. In the end, for implementation, we'll have to slim this all down. So where we are, we have brought the planning phase to a close and are moving to uh, implementation. I think as we do this, we'll have to think about what is our, quote, brand, our niche, what makes us different, special, compared to the 70 other schools of public health. And there are those characteristics, I think, that we have. Where do we focus? What will make a special partnering more? CDPHE, local health departments, innovation, advancing population in Colorado and the region in measurable ways. That would be a great thing if we could say, yep, 10 years ago, for 2008, Here's where Colorado was. Here's where it is in, I don't know, 2025. And maybe here's the mark of the school uh, through these things that we uh, did. And as we look at setting priorities, what will have immediate impact? What should we do? What's feasible? What are the resources needed? What is the relevance to our mission? So we'll have a lot to think about. So we are moving forward. We have an implementation steering committee that is established, and those folks are here. Uh, and we're going to try and rely on our existing committee structure plus some um, to go through all the recommendations to say these are the ones we should give priority to. Here's how they should be implemented. Here's how we'll know if we've been successful and assign metrics for uh, success. So this is uh, all in the uh, works. So I was thinking I could filibuster till five and then nobody would ask questions, but I've been unsuccessful at that. So I want to show this again. I showed this last year, which got paraphrased to this. Uh, ask not what your school can do for you. Ask what you can do for your school. Now. If anybody paid attention to when I introduced this a year ago, the quote actually went the other way. So it happened that my last two years of high school were at the same prep school attended by John Kennedy and Don Elliman, who happened to be in my class. And this was said by one of the headmasters and paraphrased allegedly by John Kennedy. I bring this up because, I, to me, as dean, school identity is, is critical, understanding that we have a shared mission. It's a little bit complicated, understanding that we're all in this together. We have three campuses. We have two floors in one big building. We have people in other buildings. We have students who are taking classes in really nice educational facilities that are not, you know, they're near, but they're not within the same thing. We don't walk in a door that says Colorado School of Public Health. We walk in many doors. And, you know, I think just a reminder, and this is sort of, you know, part of my job as dean is to re remind us all that we are on this same team, whether we're at UNC, CSU, in building 406, you know, Night Horse Campbell, or wherever, uh, or wherever else. And I, and I think, you know, trying to promote school-wide activities like speaker series and other things are uh, 
uh, Health and Wellness Committee, other activities I think are important. Now, things that I worry about. Uh, so, so the times they are changing. Dylan's song from long, long, long uh, ago. So even Bob Dylan was young once. Uh, and what, what are I worried about? Well, the second bullet down I already talked about. You know, what are these trends? Where are things going? Uh, our demographics, I understand that the numbers of sort of college age, university age students in Colorado is going to continue to drop for a while because of these demographics, uh, demographic shifts. So that's something we will stay concerned about. And I think some of the implications are clear, and I think have been clear to all of us that tuition can't be the only uh, revenue uh, stream. Uh, research funding and research funded. I think everybody who does research always worries about this. I think put in the context of the times they are changing, it becomes a little more difficult. Uh, as decisions are made, for example, at NIH that have broad implications like whether the National Cancer Institute will or will not support more cohort studies. I mean, these are just uh, examples. Uh, what are the paths to policy and the public views of science? We're sort of in a little bit of a shock right now, as, as I think probably many of you are aware, in terms of the disconnect of policy and what people do sometimes from the evidence, whether that's individuals making a decision to not vaccinate their children because their beliefs are more important to them than the piles of scientific evidence, or some of the direct steps being taken, for example, right now in Washington, to particularly around the environment, pull out some of the key rungs in the ladder by which you go from evidence to uh, policy. So I think, uh, and then you know, we are in exciting times around educational approaches and goals. Uh, we are in the era of digital education. It's on us. We have to think about what we're doing. We've talked about it. I've uh, had many conversations with Sheena and Scott and, and that team, and I think you know, we will have to look at what we're going to do in this new space. And to me, that's very important over the next uh, few, uh, few years. Uh, I went to the, anybody been to the Monet exhibit yet? It's great, you gotta go. Uh, you have to buy a ticket uh, for some time. It's really terrific. Uh, and, you know, Monet painted London. And some of his famous pictures in London were of the bridges and pollution. The sky was fascinating to him because of its colors and the play of the light. What he was painting was the pollution of London. And if you know the history, one culmination, this was the London fog of 1952, which killed about 10,000 people in a week from uh, air pollution. I show you this only because, um, you know, at these mixed times when there are challenges, there are always good things to do. And I, and I think, you know, again, we've, I've enumerated some of the uh, challenges. You know, I think we just have to work together to figure out how we will uh, address them. So I think this is the last. Baby Richard, this is for you. Um, this is my son and I at the top of North Maroon Peak uh, near Aspen a few years back. For those of you who know the mountain, it's uh, not for amateurs, which makes me wonder what I was doing at the top of it. Uh, actually, truth be known, my son, who's not an amateur, had dragged me up to the top of it. Uh, and here I am looking at it last summer. And you know, the, the point actually is that our lives as a school of public health with what we do are inevitably going to come with these challenges and we will keep facing them. So we have a whole new set. And, um, you know, I think I want to express optimism about dealing with them, but I think we just have to acknowledge that they are here. So with time left, I just want to say Thank you to everybody, all of you, for what you do.
thanks to everybody in the dean's office who helped me put these slides together. I thought maybe I could get somebody else from the dean's office team to give the talk, but um, I was left to uh, do it. So thanks, and let's take however much time people want to stay to uh, talk. So thanks. Go for it, somebody. Ila. Stone, you had talked about winnowing down the many opportunities to do something more natural. What's the timeline for that and the process? Okay. Um, some of that I've, are things I glossed over a little bit. We have a, we have a schedule and a timeline, and I think uh, what I see is a rolling out of implementation plans for different objectives. So that, look, if there's some easy, quick things that we can do, I think we should do them. Uh, if there are things that are longer or things that we identify that become funding priorities where we can go try and seek funding, maybe those are rolled out over the longer term. So, you know, not, not trying to weasel, I think the answer is it depends, and I think it's the right uh, right answer. But we, we, in terms of our internal processes, getting committees in place, getting structures in place, we're hoping that's all underway, you know, by the start of the new year. Anything online? We have at least five minutes. Right, so the question, I'm supposed to repeat the question now, I remember. Um, so the question is opportunities with CDPHE and I would say other local public health as well. So, you know, the, um, the dean, whomever that, whoever that is, has met with the head of CDPHE relatively regularly. When I arrived, it was a sort of Larry Walk coming to the end of his time as director as sort of the election loomed and uh, you know we had a lot of good introductory conversations and shared a number of interests. I think with um, Jill Ryan we've really been off to a very good start around talking about opportunities for collaboration. We held a meeting here October 2nd uh, that involved various, uh, various groups in the school and some of uh, her team and sort of met each other and talked about uh, opportunities uh, <clears throat> today uh, when uh, Richard Hoffman and I were together with uh, Jill. Before that, we had spent some time talking about very specific opportunities for, um, for follow-up. And I, I think what we are talking about is how CDPHE might be able to draw on some of the methodological depth that is here in particular around specific issues there's a, a hunger for some uh, training activities. And then I, I think there's really specific areas for, um, for intersection, whether that's you know, the, the mental health challenges that everyone is trying to deal with or, uh, or others. So I, I think those relationships are really doing well and, uh, and, and growing. And I think it's what we should do uh, as a school. Should have planted questions. Right. So the, the question is about um, sort of call for more interactions between this campus and the Boulder uh, campus. And there is a committee that is looking at those opportunities. And actually, Kathy Bradley is co-chair. I think we can expect something from them pretty soon. And my understanding is that you know, financial resources are going to be made available for joint projects. Now, what the mechanism will be for, for that, I don't, I don't know. But I'm sure we'll hear about it fairly, um, fairly soon. And, and, you know, clearly there's great opportunities for collaboration at Boulder. I would, I would also say, you know, remember that we are at CSU and UNC, and there's terrific opportunities for collaboration in any number of, uh, of areas. 
Okay, we can in two minutes early. I think that's uh, okay. I mean, actually, in the spirit of the uh, three three campuses, I'll be at uh, CSU uh, tomorrow for uh, their all faculty meeting and research presentations by faculty. And it's uh, putting aside the agonies of I twenty five. I really enjoy going to the other campuses and learning about. Uh, what uh, what they do. So thanks all for uh, being here, and I'll be around if you want to talk.